How many of y'all uh, ever knew an old geezer checker player? Any here ever know an old geezer checker player? Checkers? No, che yeah, checkers. But they call them checker players. Anybody ever? Yeah, your dad's not old enough to be a geezer. You've got to work on it some. Y'all ever? Anybody ever grow up in a small town where the old men all? Yeah, I know he's 35. Bell is getting there, but when he gets about twice that to 10. Yeah, he's got some work to do. Uh, <laughs> I had some distinct privileges growing up. Uh, growing up in a. Uh, small town and then being surrounded by smaller towns. The town that I grew up in, Salina, Kansas, was only about 50,000 people uh, growing up. You say, well, that's a pretty small town. Well, um, it is compared to here. It's actually, I think if Salina is the third largest city in Kansas. So Kansas City was larger and Wichita was larger, but Salina being over 50,000 was third largest city in Kansas. So that was one of the towns where everybody went to go shopping and so forth. So the actual surrounding county around Salina, I want to say would have been closer to uh, probably 90,000 or something like that. But there are a lot of little towns, small towns. And uh, so about 10 miles north of Salina, there's a little town of Bennington. And that's a town of, I want to say about 700 people. And that's where my dad grew up and where our family farm was, that was the closest town to our farm. Of course, the farm is in the country. Uh, there's no such thing as a farm in the city. If you're a city farmer, I'm sorry uh, that you think you're a farmer, but you're not. And uh, you've got to be in the country to be a farmer. And you've got to be in the country to live in the country. If you think you live in the country because you're on an acre of property, I'm sorry, you don't live in the country. Uh, you need to be able to you know, fly to your uh, property in order to actually be in the country, really. In the country, that's the way. It, Brother Matt, I'm right about that, right? I'm visiting yeah. back in. No, you don't know anything, Bella. You can't talk anymore. <laughs> wow. <laughs> fifty thousand pigs. <laughs> you had fifty thousand pigs on your farm? No, no, no. 50, oh, you had, It's a big town. Oh, fifty thousand is big. Yes. Big yeah. Town. And uh, small towns, what? Hundred, two hundred, uh, somewhere 2, there. Yeah, two thousand or less or whatever. I went to school in Abilene, about thirty-five miles from Salina. And that was a town of uh, about less than 7,000 people. And then a lot of little small towns, a couple hundred. We crushed cars, our family did. We did portable car crushing. And so a lot of our, farm, our car crushing was actually out on farms. You know, farmers accumulate scrap, metal, cars. And sometimes you go crush 100 cars off of a farmer's pasture. And you, know, you say, How's a, how does a farmer end up with 100 cars? Well, it's really easy. Uh, they all do, <laughs> out in the Midwest and so forth. So we crush on in salvage yards, some of our country salvage yards. One of the things I always enjoyed doing, though, was when we would go into the small towns, my dad would always find the geezers, uh, the old people that would sit around. They, they'd show up every morning at a cafe or a pump mark, a gas station or something, and they'd drink coffee, and everybody would sit there and talk. And that's actually where he did business. Uh, if you were trying to meet people in the town, or if you're, if you're my dad, you're trying to find cars to crush, and you want to find out who has metal, well, you need to go sit down around the geezers. They know everything and everybody around. You can't Google, you know, who has 100 cars in their pasture. Uh, you have to ask a geezer about it. And every now and again, you'd run into the checker players, guys that would play checkers. When I was 10 years old, I started playing checkers, and I got good enough that my sister couldn't beat me and my brother couldn't beat me, and that I could compete with my dad pretty well, and I thought I was pretty good at checkers. And I remember going to Christmas one time, at our, at, our, at our farm, at my grandma and grandpa's place. And there was this old guy, uh, his, la his name was Mike Torpy, and he would have been a geezer when my dad was a kid. And he was actually the school bus driver. And I fancied myself a checker player, and he asked if I wanted to play checkers. And I didn't even know they had rules for checkers, like, you know, if you don't want to jump, you have to jump anyway. I didn't know that was a rule. I, if you didn't want to jump, we didn't make anybody jump in ours. You know, you pass it over. So I remember making a move, and then him making a move that was like boom, 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 clearing the board on me, you know, and uh, really beating me pretty badly. And it bothered me a little bit at 10 years old. I had a little bit of competitive nature and tried him a couple more times and realized I don't like checkers. <laughs> <laughs> Not very much of a fun game. And uh, 
Throughout life, I've realized that you may be pretty good at something, but there's always somebody out there that's better. You may be pretty talented or pretty skilled, and even if there's not someone out there that's better, sometimes there's someone out there that's luckier. I, there are guys that like to fight for fun, get in fights, fist fights. It's something I realized a long time ago, though it may be fun to challenge somebody and try to fight them. All it takes is for a guy to just get a lucky hit, and you're out. You're out cold, or you're dead. And, uh, you know, <laughs> there's, you can be proud about winning in some things, but one of the things that you'll learn if you get any, gain any experience at all is that as much as you know, there's somebody else out there that knows more, or as, much, as, as good as you I may be at something, there will be someone that's better at it. And pretty much anybody's good at something. I mean, pretty much everyone has something that they're good at. Uh, if you're double jointed, you might be able to flex better than everybody else in the room. Uh, I hear met a double jointed person, can you do this? And they do something that they know you can't do. And they act as though, <laughs> they act as though, you know, they worked hard for their abilities. But they did, and they're just double jointed. Uh, you ever met the person that just, they're just smart. I mean, they never study. They don't need to study. They don't need to learn. They just know everything. You know, it's just, they're just smart. And it, it, if they hear something once, they retain it. They hear something, they comprehend it. And it's just easy for them. And then there's people that work hard. and they, You know, it's frustrating, that smart person because you have to work hard for something and they can just do it easily. There's always somebody smarter than that person. You know something that's really unacceptable uh, and something that, that's natural in all of us is pride. Pride. God hates it. He's never liked it. And we've all got a lot of it. We all have a good dose, strong dose of pride. God doesn't want us to. Anthony, are you trying to tell me something? No. Oh, you're just doing an emotion? Okay. All right. He keeps doing this, and I don't know what that means. I think he's communicating with me. Is, are you hot? Okay. I am too. I thought it was yeah. because I was shooting hoops earlier, but somebody tampered with the um, air conditioner. Anyone else have a gesture for me? <laughs> okay. <laughs> All right. Now that we've communicated. <laughs> I thought I was just cooking because I was shooting baskets a little bit before the service. But it's cold and it's hot in here, I mean to say. So anyway, something that really ought to belong among the believers, though, is pride. How many of you enjoy, uh, for friendship, not for amusement, how many of you enjoy being around people that are prideful? I said, not for your amusement. Sometimes somebody's prideful, and their pride will amuse you. You get a kick out of how wonderful they feel about themselves, and you really kind of feel wonderful about their the way they feel. And uh, that's not nice, and I shouldn't be like that. Neither should you. But how do you enjoy just being around somebody who just thinks they're better than you because they're double-jointed or because God gave them a swifter intellect or because uh, they're taller or uh, shorter or uh, faster or slower. People can be prideful about just about anything. Honestly, they can be prideful about being poor, prideful about being rich. I've met folks that are just, they feel like they're better than everybody because they're poor. You know, well, you know, I'm poor. And they kind of brag about everything that they do because they're poor. And sometimes you think, you know, you're proud about that. You think you're better than everybody just because you're poor. But you're not. That's just... That's what God wants you to be, and there's nothing special about that. Now, I'm not to tell anybody tonight you're not special. God made you very unique. But something that ought to belong among the believers, ought to be a characteristic of believers, is this area of pride. And you know, Scripture has some things to say about it in a number of places, and I just want to look at a principle this evening 
and to try to help us as believers to maybe wrap our minds around a simple truth. And it's, it's found several places in the scripture, a lot more than what we'll reference this evening. But let's begin by reading 1 Timothy chapter 1 and verse 4. And actually, let's read 3 and 4. And then we'll just pray and ask the Lord to guide us as we look at some scripture tonight. Paul tells Timothy in verse 3, he says, I besought thee to abide still in Ephesus when I went into Macedonia, that thou mightest charge some that they teach no other doctrine, neither give heed to fables and endless genealogies which minister questions, rather than godly edifying, which is in faith, so do. So Father, please help us tonight to comprehend what we're told in the Scripture. That's not to be characteristic of believers. And I pray that as we uh, draw conclusions that we would do so in light of what the Scripture plainly teaches and be helped by it, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, we read that verse in 1 Timothy chapter 1. You may think that, you know, Pastor, that's not specifically talking about pride. But let's go ahead and go to... Uh, Verses seven or chapter four of First Timothy and read verses seven and eight. Uh, yeah, better read verse six. If thou put the brethren in remembrance of these things, thou shalt be a good minister of Jesus Christ. Well, that's encouraging, isn't it? First Timothy four six. If you don't know where I'm at, if thou put the brethren in remembrance of these things, thou shalt be a good minister of Jesus Christ. Now those are actually really comforting words if you're striving to be a good minister of Jesus Christ. I'm a pastor, that's what Timothy was, and that was the, uh, that was the office that he was fulfilling. And I'll tell you something, I just like to be a good pastor. God didn't call me really to be anything else in life. I'm sort of a jack of all trades in a lot of ways. And as they like to say, master of none. But I'll tell you what I'm trained for, what I'm called to, is to be a pastor. In the area of pastoring specifically, I've been called to church planting, uh, beginning ministries, and uh, trying to, to grow uh, ministry, grow people. And if I could just accomplish one thing in life, I would like to be a good minister. Good minister. Now, minister is not a title minister is service. It's serving. And I would like to do that, and I'd like to be a good minister specifically of Jesus Christ. And so when I read a phrase like we find in verse 6 of 1 Timothy 4, my interest is certainly piqued. And I hope for a number of folks in here. I'm praying about several of you young men that God will call you to be ministers of Jesus Christ, specifically pastors. I know a lot more folks are called to be preachers and pastors and deacons and, and leaders in the churches than what we're seeing. And so I pray for you, and I hope that when something like that is read, that there is a desire in you that you'd say, you know, if I'm going to be a minister, I want to be a good one. And uh, so that reminds me of a guy, Tony Caraballo. Melissa, whenever I say the word good, I say good. And uh, there's a guy that used to be in our church early on, and, and uh, he ended up staying with us somewhat. He uh, <laughs> had a definite opinions about everything. He's a, a Puerto Rican guy. He was absolutely hilarious. And he was kidding one of the guys in our church at the time, one of the single guys, about uh, some girl that the guy was interested. And he said, uh, he said, I'm a psychiatrist. He said, I'm not a very good one. <laughs> and so whenever I read the word good of anything, I think of Tony Caraballo. I'm a, he'd say, I'm this, not a very good one. He'd say, <laughs> but uh, when I read about being a good minister of Jesus Christ, I think I want to be a good one. And I think that anyone who wants to serve the Lord Jesus in this way ought to want to be a good one. By the way, you just want to be a good Christian. Do you? I mean, I think that we do. And so here's what he said is necessary. You need to help remember the things, of course, that are taught up to this point. But notice in verse 7, he said, But refuse profane and old wives' fables and exercise thyself rather unto godliness. And then we know verse 8, for bodily exercise profiteth little, but godliness is profitable unto all things, having promise of the life that now is and of that which is to come. Now we'll come full circle back to here in just a little bit. But there are a couple of things that Paul expressly told 
young Timothy, the pastor at the church at Ephesus, that specifically were to be avoided in the church. And one of those things was that the people were not to give heed to fables and endless genealogies which minister questions rather than godly edifying which is in faith. Now I know that's a mouthful, but it's, it's important, it's helpful. In verse 7 of chapter 4, he said, Refuse profane and old wives' fables, and exercise thyself rather unto godliness. There's a theme in 1 Timothy, as Paul is writing this pastoral epistle, there's a theme of godliness, a theme of helping individuals to be godly. Could someone open the door and help whoever's out there come in? There's someone by that door there. Uh, there's a theme, oh, I think it's Charlie's dad. Uh, there's a theme of godliness, of helping people to be godly, and that's what a pastor is supposed to do. Did you know that having God knowledge doesn't make you godly? You know, some Christians think they can substitute knowing everything, at least thinking that they know everything. They think that they can substitute those things for actual practical godliness, that is, being filled with the Spirit and uh, being able to practically live for Jesus Christ. You know that I have uh, been saved long enough to recognize that Christianity, being a follower of Jesus Christ, more ought to be lived, more ought to be practiced, uh, than it ought to be talked about. Now, I'm not one of these people that wear the blah, blah, blah t-shirts. You know what I'm talking about? You can walk the walk, but can you talk the talk? I know that's catchy and people like to say that. But the reality of it is, is that Christian living is practical. In other words, you ought to live what you believe. And you hear Paul in, in 1 Timothy is telling, uh, telling young Timothy, he said, I don't want you to spend your time or give heed, give heed means to pay attention to, don't give heed to fables uh, and endless genealogies. Well, what's a fable? You guys know what a fable is, right? A fable oftentimes is a story, and it has a kind of a wisdom to it, but usually the wisdom is man's wisdom instead of God's wisdom. We're not talking about a proverb, uh, which is inspired and given by inspiration of God, but we're talking about literally a fable. You know we've got a lot of fables, don't we? There are a lot of fables in Christianity. And um, sadly, people make doctrine out of those. You know, uh, there's a lot of them that we could use uh, for instances of. Uh, one that <laughs> comes to me is uh, a fable of the social gospel. That is the what would Jesus do? You remember you had the WWJD? I was watching a, a machinist video, and uh, as the guy is machining, uh, he talked about some spooky, weird concept he was creating, making a vortex generator. And so he said, boy, this kind of scares me a little bit. must have some deviltry in it. And so he pulled out, instead of WD-40 to lubricate his uh, machine work, he pulled out WWJD-40 and uh, made just a little bit of a joke about it. But what would Jesus do? A lot of people think that's pretty clever, pretty practical. And actually, you can go in the Scripture and find out. But if you look at what most people think Jesus would do, a lot of times they're wrong. In other words, it's a lot of man's wisdom. And that's what fables oftentimes are. You read Aesop's fables. Uh, there are a lot of times, you know, they seem wise, but a lot of times the wisdom falls down. The wisdom doesn't actually, isn't, it's not inspired. It's not always true. And then there's a lot of fables about things that people just believe that just aren't always true. And a lot of Christians are more superstitious than they are actually... Uh, knowledgeable about simple Bible teaching, the Bible doctrine. Here are some superstitious things that I hear that frustrate me sometimes. Marriage superstition. I hate marriage superstition and marriage counseling on the basis of superstition. I know I said I hate, but it's actually the truth. I can't stand it. There's, uh, I have a dear friend in the Lord that gives me marriage wisdom when he's talking about people's marriage problems. And I just think, brother, there's no wonder you have problems it, it, when, you, when you think things like that. For instance, the first year and the seventh year are the hardest years. You ever heard that? The first year and the seventh year are the hardest years. Listen, don't get married if you're dumb like that. <laughs> Seriously. I'm serious. If you're planning on having a bad first year and a bad seventh year, you've got problems. 
You need to figure out what the Bible says about having a good marriage. And just obey what God says. Husbands, love your wives. You love your wife in your first year, it'll be a really good year. Wives, submit yourselves unto your own husbands as unto the Lord. You submit like you do to the Lord, you'll have a good first year. And the seventh year, I mean, what is that? You know? I mean, the people just have these things, and you know what that is? That's a fable. It's a superstition, and God didn't, God didn't give it to us. And so you figure out what the source of that nonsense actually is. There's a lot of that in Christianity, a lot of just wisdom uh, that, that doesn't can coincide with sound doctrine. Uh, you got to be like them to reach them. You know, you got to be able to relate to them to be able to reach them. How much like Jesus are we, and how much like us was Jesus? You say, well, Pastor, you know, Jesus came in the likeness of sinful flesh. Yeah, but he, Jesus looked like a sinful man, but he was anything but a sinful man. Right? Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation. What person, what man tries to diminish or eradicate his own reputation? Just tries to be nothing and nobody to everybody. In other words, what one of us as Christians actually strives when we're with someone to deliberately give off the impression, not out of pride, not out of some kind of conniving, manipulative uh, motive, but just to give off the impression that you're better than me. You know, we always want to let folks know, I'm just as good as you are. Or I'm better than you are. You know, that's not what Jesus did. Was Jesus better than us? Come on. You know, I just think of about, you know, Jesus' rightful place. And, and I love the song at Christmas time, How Should a King Come? Because Jesus is the King of Kings. But you know, the song even gets it all wrong. Because it talks about how an earthly king would come. My friend, nothing this earth can afford by way of palace or food or accommodations or treatment is worthy of the king of the universe, Jesus. But when Jesus came, he did not come as a king. He came as a servant. He served the servants. And so we have a lot of fables. We have a lot of notions as believers that directly contradict what we're supposed to be as believers, and I will submit to you this evening that that ought to be a part of the way that we think. Now, I want to just uh, deal with one concept, one notion uh, this evening, just one, and we'll be finished. I kind of took a long time to introduce it to give you an idea of where we're coming from, where we're going. We want to deal with intellectual pride, intellectual pride, and there's a lot of it in Christianity, a lot of intellectual pride. Uh, let me just put it this way and, and try to be nice about it. I've met enough people in my lifetime to know that there are many people who are my intellectual inferiors. That sounds prideful. And I've also met enough people in my lifetime to know that there are a lot of people who are my intellectual superiors. And I've found, I've actually discovered that on a practical level, a person's ability intellectually, whether they're inferior or superior, very seldom actually coincides with the practical application of their intellect. That is, you might be really smart, but if you don't do anything with it, it doesn't matter much. There are some people that are really, really tickled about their internet IQ test that they scored 150 on. You know everybody scores 150 or greater on an internet IQ test. So if you've got less than 150, you're not very intelligent, I'm sorry to say. But uh, you may have an actual 75 IQ and you'll get a 150 on an internet test and then uh, that's just clickbait. So I, I hope I didn't ruin somebody's life by, by telling you that just now. But there are a lot of folks that, I mean, honestly, that score, whatever that score is that they achieved, makes them feel pretty good. And they go around, well, what's your, what's your IQ? What'd you get on your IQ test? You know, and you always want to make up a number that's higher than any possibility, you know, to, to tell that person, or a number that's just really, really low. It depends on which side of the humor that you want to, you know, if you want to really shock somebody, 
you know, I got a 50. That's pretty good, right? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> On the internet one. <laughs> the reality of it is, folks, is that how smart you are really um, will never impress God. Matter of fact, you know the whole book of Proverbs talks a lot about wisdom. And it talks about a person who's simple, who would be a 50 kind of a guy, and how he can be wise. I don't know where the scorner where the scorner is at on the intellectual spectrum, but my guess is he's probably got a high IQ. If I had to guess, I've met some dumb scorners, like like you know, not very intelligent scorners. I'm not saying they don't exist, but I've also met some that are pretty good at something. Maybe not anything practical, but they're good at test taking or they're good at something and they're really proud about it. And they kind of scoff at anything and everybody because they don't think anyone in the world is as smart as they are. And they're scoffers. And, um, you know, the Bible talks about how a simple person can be wise. I've met some successful people in my life, and I'm just talking about humanly speaking. I've met some folks that are pretty successful. And when I've actually sat down with them and gotten to know them on a personal level, I've realized a couple of things about them. First of all, I've realized, you know what, they're really successful, but I'm not sure they're really, really super smart. But they just know how to do basic things well. In other words, they're wise. If this is the best thing to do, they do it. And I found that people that are successful normally usually are disciplined to do what they know. It doesn't mean they're smarter than everybody else, but it just they apply what they know. And there are people that are very intelligent that really never produce or never do anything, but they're really proud about it because they know what they could do if they ever wanted to. And friend, that's just pride. If there's a place that pride doesn't belong in particular, it's intellectual pride. And uh, you say, Pastor, how does, that, how does that fit in Christianity? You know, there are Christians that are intellectually proud. There are Christians <laughs> that transliterate Latin words and call them doctrines <laughs> so that they can sound as though they're intelligent because they said a word that you don't know what the word means. And it's about a doctrine. And uh, they like to just label things and because they know labels or they study some minutia they think they're really intelligent. There are Christians literally that doctrinally don't do anything practical. What are some practical practical things a believer ought to do? Well on a on a, on a very very simple basic level a believer ought to make disciples, ought they? Ought to preach the gospel and teach people to observe the things that Jesus taught. Now you can analyze the words that Jesus said and you can create systematic doctrine from them. But you know, the things that Jesus said were actually pretty simple, pretty practical. And you don't have to be a rocket surgeon or brain scientist in order to be able to achieve understanding of the things that Jesus taught. I'm serious about that. You have to do what Jesus said. And there are a lot of individuals who would rather write books about what Jesus said and develop systematic doctrine, systematic theology about what Jesus said instead of just telling people what Jesus said and doing it. There's a lot of that in Christianity. A lot of it comes down to intellectual pride. Uh, false doctrine always involves intellectual pride. Do you know the more false a doctrine, the more pages it takes in a book to articulate and defend it? Charlie, was it you the other day that was telling me about something where a guy wrote, Oh, it was about the whole, uh, that's, that's right, it was about the whole um, sons of God, daughters of men, and a guy wrote a 500-page book. Well, it's over 500. Over 500-page book, over that, that uh, fragment of the Scripture, which is easily understood if you just understand the theme of Genesis. That is, that there was a godly line, there's always been a seed of godly people, and there have always been uh, godless people, and they've created this subhuman spe super species of individuals who knows if they have a soul or not. I'm sure the book covers that. And they developed a whole doctrine out of something that, my friend, matters not an iota to God. Well, it does matter to God because they're wasting their lives on it. You know, and it opens up doors and questions. 
endless genealogies and endless questions. Okay, if there's a subhuman species, then are there aliens? Is there life on other planets? Is the sacrifice that Jesus made on Calvary, is it only for people on planet Earth? Or is, did Jesus die for the sins of other people? Or are there planets that Jesus made where there were no sin, where there was no sin? And if so, why didn't God just... You know, it's all this just questions and questions and questions, and that's what this kind of notions, these kind of notions engender. Nonsense. Foolishness. And the Scripture says we're not to waste our time on it. We're not to spend our time on it. And there are some Christians who think because they can tell you what somebody wrote and what page he wrote it on, that they're superior Christians. When actually, my friend, if they don't tell the lost how to know Jesus, they're lousy Christians. See, the Christianity word... Hey, listen, I'm not saying you ought to know what you believe. Let's go to Hebrews chapter 6, though. Here's a, here's a supportive uh, passage of Scripture to give us a little bit of an idea of uh, what Paul is telling Timothy and in just another more practical way. You know this passage of Scripture. Right in chapter 5 of Hebrews, uh, the Holy Spirit is telling the Hebrew Christians, Jewish Christians urging them not to go back on their faith. And he's right in the middle of a discourse or beginning a discourse that goes all the way through chapter 7 on Melchizedek, who we really don't know a lot about. And he said, I want to tell you some things about him, but it's a waste of time to tell you because you're too immature and the, the, the things are too spiritually advanced for you because of your spiritual immaturity. And then in chapter 6, after he's told them that strong meat belongs to those that are full age. In chapter 6 and verse 1, the Holy Spirit said, Therefore, leaving the principles of the doctrine of Christ, let us go on into perfection, not laying again the foundation of repentance from dead works and of faith toward God. Now stop there just for a second. Do you know that the number one doctrine that's debated today is the doctrine of repentance? It's couched, it's called a lot of things. Lordship, salvation. It's called Calvinism. It's called a lot of things, but ultimately what it comes down to is the doctrine of repentance. And what does repentance mean? My friend, if you ever came to saving faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, you know what repentance was then. And it's a tragedy that after years of being born again, you still don't understand it. That it's a lifetime study that you've got to read book after book after book and write paper after paper and article after article. And repentance is so complicated. My friend, repentance is for children to understand. It's simple. It isn't complicated. Uh, the Holy Spirit mentioned not only repentance, it mentioned as well uh, the faith toward, toward God. Repentance and a faith toward God. Well... Is faith something we do, or is faith something that God puts in us, that God makes us do? My friend, the word faith means believe. It is connected. The word pistuo is connected with the same word uh, fellow, which is volitional. That is, it, it's, it's choice. It's a determination of the mind. The very notion of what the word faith means carries with it a, a definition or an understanding that it is believing. And believing is done by the believer. Therefore, the believer believes. Now, that isn't so complicated, but there are believers who don't believe that they have to believe or that they have a choice about believing. They think, well, it just happens to me. Just a switch flips inside me. God puts light in me and now I believe or I don't believe. And they don't think they're even responsible for believing when the very word itself is simple to understand. And they can go round and round and round and round. Faith toward God. It's a choice. It's a decision. It's a determination that you make. You either will believe or you won't believe. Period. And that's what the word means. And yet it can be so complicated. Listen, my friend, I've heard hours of discussion. I have read book after book after book. And I just want to tell you something. It isn't that complicated. And sometimes intellectual pride kicks in and a person thinks because they can throw a lot of jargon at something or theorize and postulate 
over something a lot, that that makes them intellectually superior because you never even thought of the thoughts that they're thinking. <laughs> Listen, if you're in a place where you're thinking thoughts no one else ever thought, I wish they didn't legalize marijuana. That's all I can say. That wasn't very nice, was it? The reality of it, my friend, is that if you're thinking thoughts nobody ever thought before, you're probably off track a little bit. God doesn't want us to be into this nonsense. Now, I'm not saying we need to not know what's out there. We not need to know not know what false doctrine is or not know what the truth is. I'm just saying that truth is simple. And that there is an intellectual pride that's inherent in us, and it is a substitution for godliness. In other words, the ability to discuss spiritual things has become a substitute in many believers' lives for actually being practically godly. You know what? If you believe in Jesus, you know what faith is. You know if you've repented. You know what repentance is. Uh, do you know that if you live godly in Christ Jesus, you won't be confused about what real godliness is? You'll know what it is. And there is a level of Christianity that's very impractical and it's a cover-up, it's a ruse to distract from believers not being godly. Uh, in the rest of the verse, he talks about a baptism. You say, Pastor, who debates baptism? Did you know that there's a debate about whether the mode of baptism is sprinkling or whether it is uh, baptism? <laughs> Whether the word baptism means baptism. And you say, not in the day that the author of Hebrews... No, they, I don't think they'd invented sprinkling yet at that time. Uh, there, there were, they sprinkled blood you know, in sacrifices, but sprinkling meant sprinkling, and baptism meant baptism uh, in the original intent of the word. But which baptism? The baptism of John the Baptist... The baptism of the Holy Ghost, the baptism of a believer following conversion, a baptism of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, or of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost. Nonsense. Nonsense. Baptism's baptism. We're talking about believers' baptism here. And all these things lead to intellectual pride. You can, you can argue this position or that position or whatever it is. And the honest truth is, is that God's not having any of it. He's not interested in any of it. Let's go to Colossians. Colossians chapter 2. This is in the midst of a portion of Scripture that's really letting us know that justification is by faith in Christ alone. And that salvation is by faith without the deeds of the law or the works of the law. Colossians chapter 2. And uh, the Apostle Paul is warning the church at Colossae not to be spoiled. Verse 8, Beware lest any man spoil you through philosophy and vain deceit after the tradition of men, after the rudiments of the world, and not after Christ. And he's warning the believers, don't get ruined. Don't get plundered. Don't get spoiled by being taught things that are philosophical from the world's perspective that are after the rudiments. In other words, they're based in the culture or based in the purpose, the basics of what the world believes, instead of in Jesus Christ. And then he goes on to talk about the practical aspect of it. Verse 18. Well, no, let's go back to verse 16. Let no man therefore judge you in meat or in drink or in respect of an holy day or of the new moon or of the Sabbath days. We alluded to this last Wednesday evening when we were looking at transcendent truths. And uh, we were talking about Christian liberty. In verse 17, the Bible says all these things which are a shadow of things to come, but the body is of Christ. And they become distractions. They become the thing about be is about the day, or the thing is about the moon, or the thing is about this thing. And God uh, in Jesus is all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. Um, Look at verse 20, or verse 18. Let no man beguile you, or that means to deceive or trick you of your reward in a voluntary humility 
and worshiping of angels, intruding into those things which he hath not seen, vainly puffed up by his fleshly mind, and not holding the head from which all the body by joints and bands have nourished, ministered, nourishment ministered, and knit together increases with the increase of God. Look at verse 20. Wherefore, if you be dead with Christ from the rudiments of the world, why, as though living in the world, are you subject to ordinances? I've said it many times, and I think it's worth our noting. I know, I know it's right. That denominationalism exists around false doctrine. In other words, you ask yourself the question, why so many factions? Why so many denominations? Because people get together about what they're wrong about. People unify around false doctrine. You name a denomination, and I can tell you the doctrine that that denomination has united around. You say, Pastor, but you're Baptist. Baptist is not a denomination. I recognize that there are Baptists who consider themselves denominational, but they do not know what it means to be Baptist. Uh, Baptist, I've said many times, Baptists were non-denominational before it was cool. You know what Baptist means? It means to baptize. A Baptist is one who baptizes. That's what a Baptist is. That's what Baptists were called. And they said, well, that's accurate. And it's as good a label as any. I'd rather be called a Christian. And so when people ask me, what denomination are you? I say, I'm not. I'm a Christian. And they say, well, what denomination? I say, I'm not a denomination. Well, what's the name of your church? Uh, Fort Lauderdale Baptist Church. Oh, so you're a Baptist denomination. No, we baptize Christians. <laughs> That's what Baptists do. That's why we're Baptists. I don't want to be ambiguous. I don't want people to... Uh, come into this church and find out we're Church of Christ or find out we're Methodist or find out we're, uh, we're Reformed or we're this or we're that. We don't want to be sneaky about it. So we're Baptists. That's what we are. We believe what Baptists traditionally believe. Bible authority, autonomy of the local church, priests of the believers, two ordinances, individual atonement, saved church membership, and we believe in the doctrine of the Godhead or the Trinity. That's what Baptists believe. And if you believe the same, you're a Baptist too, whether you admit it or not. Denominationalism, though, unites around false doctrine. It unites around false doctrine. And uh, that's where the Seventh-day Adventists come from. It's keeping of Sabbaths, no moons. A lot of these doctrines come from individuals beguiling and plundering and spoiling. And we as believers ought to be wary of that. We ought to be guarded against it. We ought to be wary of being called after the name of a man. Or called after something other than the Lord Jesus Christ. And uh, we don't want to be beguiled of our reward. Um, so, what are these things then? Well, my friend, they're Christian time wasters, is what they are, if you want to just label them. And now I'm not saying, I'm not saying that, that uh, I'm the one who makes the best use of my time. I want to be better about it. Uh, how I spend and how I use my time. But I'll tell you something I don't do very much anymore. I don't debate people very much about anything. If someone wants to know some truth, if they want an answer for something, I'm happy to open the Scripture. I'm happy to give them an answer. I'm happy to laugh at somebody who's really whacked out and wrong about something. But, I'm being sarcastic, smile with me, folks. Uh, but the truth of the matter is, is that I don't... When somebody calls me up on the phone that I've never met before and they've heard something I preached, and it's on YouTube, and they would say, you know, Pastor, can I just have a minute of your time? I say, well, what would you like? What would you like my time for? And if they say, well, I want to discuss thus and so, I say, well, what, where, are you, what, where are you coming from on it? And if they tell me where they're coming from, say, well, you know, we don't really agree about that. So uh, if you'd like to know what I believe about it, there's a whole lot of it out on the Internet. You can go watch it. Oh, you like to. It's already there, and I, I'm not really interested in arguing with you today. Now, every so, ever so often, I'll be driving on a long trip, and I'll say, you lucked out. I've got a lot of time to waste, and I'd like to waste it on you today. Let's just argue for 12 hours if you'd like, whatever. I'm kidding. I am sarcastic enough, unfortunately, sometimes that I'll say things that I shouldn't say. Uh, but the reality of it is, is I don't have time to argue with people about things. I've found that people that argue don't preach the gospel very much. They don't live for Jesus very much. They just want to think that they're intellectually superior. They're right and someone else is wrong. And they just want to feel like they're better than someone else is. And there isn't really much room for that. Listen, you as a believer ought to be confident about what you believe. You ought to be confident about what you believe because you found it in the Word of God and because this book is sufficient. And you ought to be wise. 
You ought to be honestly open-minded. You know, a lot of folks call themselves open-minded. In actuality, they're not. They have a presupposition before they ever study a doctrine. They know what the conclusion they draw. And uh, God does not have permission to change their mind, even if they're wrong. You ought to be open-minded. But friend, you ought to just go to the Scripture and believe what it says. And so now we see in verse uh, 20 of Colossians chapter 2, Wherefore, if ye be dead with Christ from the rudiments of the world, why is the living in the world he is subject to ordinances? Touch not, taste not, handle not. Pastor, I just want to know in your church, do people in your church, if you guys, would you have a barbecue? Would you have a barbecue in your church? Would you eat pork? Well, it depends on how cheap we can get it. To be honest with you. <laughs> uh, you know, if it offended somebody, we would. You know, honestly. But the reality of it is, is this the whole touch not, taste not, handle not isn't spiritual. Um, which all are to perish with the using, all these things, after the commandments and doctrines of men, which things have indeed a show of wisdom in will worship and humility and neglecting of the body, not in any honor to the satisfying of the flesh. That Christians are so proud about their fasting. And you know, they kind of overlook a principle of if you're fasting, you're supposed to kind of not really let people know about it so that you don't have a reward of men. That is, you're not supposed to try to do it to impress men. You're trying to do it in order to, uh, in order to uh, bring your flesh into submission and to get a hold of God. But a lot of Christians want to let folks know I haven't eaten anything all day today. So uh, just, you know, if I pass out or something, that's why. You know, and listen, you have voluntary humility and you want a reward of man. Uh, God doesn't have any time for that. That's a time waster. It's a Christian time waster. Intellectual, intellectual superiority, thinking you're intellectually superior is a time waster. Uh, go to uh, the middle of your Bible, right after Proverbs, Ecclesiastes, uh, and chapter 12, and I'll probably be there and read it before you get there, but go ahead and give it a good shot. Ecclesiastes chapter 12. And uh, the conclusion, when, uh, when Solomon is talking about what a vanity, the reason that most people live life for, he's concluded in verse 13 by saying, let us hear the conclusion of the whole matter. Fear God and keep His commandments, for this is the whole duty of man. But go back to verse 12 of, of uh, Ecclesiastes chapter 12. And he said this, And further by these my son be admonished, of making many books there is no end, and much study is a weariness of the flesh. Well, I don't think there are some Christians there. I mean, they just haven't made it. They don't feel respected until they've written a book on theology of some kind. They've got a book out about this or that. You know, the hard thing for me when I have a friend that tells me they've just written a book about something is that I already know that there's another book that someone else has written that's probably better than theirs. And that's sort of the benchmark. And I always feel bad for them. I think, why did you reinvent the wheel? You know, first of all, I already got a Bible. And so you're not going to write something that's more edifying or more worthwhile to read than the Scripture. Now, I've been helped by some practical books. I'll, I'll throw some out there. Let me tell you some books uh, that, that you could be helped by that are very, very practical. Just throw some old classics out there. You know, R.A. Torrey wrote a couple of just little booklets, and you could download them on PDF. One of them is How to Pray, and the other one is How to Study the Bible. And you know, they're just really practical. A lot of, a lot of believers don't think about methods for how to study the Bible, like just a good good study method. There are a lot of different ways to study the Bible, and it's the same book, has the same meaning, but a lot of different ways of going at it so that you're effective. And I found R.A. Torrey's book, How to Study the Bible, has helped me help a lot of people. Another one that I, is helpful is, is, like I said, how to, how to Pray. And he wrote some books that John, the, John Rice summarized on being filled with the Holy Ghost, being filled with the Holy Spirit. John Rice wrote a book entitled The Power of Pentecost. And it's the best book on, on just being Spirit-filled and, and dealing with uh, the practical matter of having the fullness of God's power in your life and knowing God's Holy Spirit, being acquainted with the Spirit of God and, and the power of having God's Spirit flow out of you and through you and use you. And that's a practical book. And I could go on. I could give you some names of old books. But when somebody writes a new book about something like that, I just think, you know what, everybody... I mean, everybody's written a book on discipleship. There's just a zillion books on discipleship out there. You know the good one? The one you use? The one you actually apply? <laughs> that's the good one. There's all kinds of books on prayer. You know the good one? 
<laughs> well, the Bible's a good book. Good book on prayer. But you know the one, the good one? The good one is the one that, that actually helps you pray. Who cares who wrote it? And who cares what it said? A guy that prays is going to get a hold of God. And a guy that doesn't isn't. A guy that studies the Bible is going to learn things about God. And the guy who doesn't is going to have a book on his shelf. You can write books and you can read books. And all of that is tickling your intellect. But the reality of it is, is not much of it is good for anything. Solomon said, <laughs> the making of books, there's no end. I'm a book guy. Uh, my office is in the shed right now. It's not even in the shed. My books are in the shed. But I've got, I've got a room full of books, and I've read most of them. And I, I like reading. My wife will tell you I, I read just about constantly. I could be doing something else, and I'm still reading. It's just something that I enjoy doing. I like to read. But, friend, it doesn't make me godly. And godliness is what God wants, isn't it? Fear God and keep His commandments, for this is the whole duty of man. So making of books there is no end, and much study is a weariness to the flesh. And I just want to suggest to you, believer, that it's imperative for us that we reject theological pride, intellectual pride, particularly in the areas of spiritual matters. You may meet someone who you... Uh, think is not nearly as studied as you, but my friend, if they know God, they know more than you do. You've never met anyone who has a better relationship with God than you can have, if you'd like to. Jeremy, you've never met anyone who has a better relationship with God than you can have, if you'd like to, if you'd make it a study of your life. And the reality of it is, is that if this evening you left here and you said, you know what, I've got to get some of those books Pastor told me about. I've got to read them and memorize them so I can tell people what I know. You missed it. Because the reality of it is, is that godliness is knowing God. And that's really practical. That's spending time with God. That's investing in spiritual matters, spiritual things. That involves understanding simple things and obedience of the same. That's what we ought to strive for in the church. Do you know if you could describe our church using the word godly? That would be just about the biggest compliment that anyone could label us with, wouldn't it? I don't mean holier than thou. I don't mean pious and you know all the, the terms people. But just... You know what, if you want to, you know, their music's horrible. Brother Taj sings like a frog. But they know God. And if you, you don't sing like a frog, he knows it. Okay. <laughs> Sorry, Brother Taj. Now, you know what, you can say whatever you want to about our singing. You can say whatever you want to about our looks. You can say, man, they're stuck in the 70s. They don't know how to dress. Uh, you know, whatever you want to about anything. But if you could just say that the people there help me to know God better. then we'd be a church like Paul described to Timothy. It'd be too bad if, if you said something like, you know, they got some of the smartest people I've ever met. But you didn't say, you know what, the, the people love God. And they teach you how to really know Him. It'd be too bad, wouldn't it? Wouldn't it be too bad if you left here and you said, you know what, pastor's intelligent? That'd be a tragedy. If pastor doesn't know God, doesn't show you how to have a relationship with Him. Do you understand what I'm saying this evening? Mm -hmm. We need to reject the Paul. I'm not saying we have to be unpolished. I'm not saying we have to be ignorant. We can go the other direction. I think some people are proud about their ignorance. They're just proud of being dumb. Now, you can go all directions with that. Now, you understand where I'm coming from. It's a balanced perspective, but godliness... What you know doesn't mean a thing in the world if you don't know God and live for Him. And you can't help anybody. You can write books and waste people's time reading them or make money off of selling them. I don't know why people write books sometimes. But Paul wanted Timothy 
to get people to reject a lot of the nonsense, the fables and the genealogies and, and uh, the superstitions, and he wanted them to teach the people to be godly. I suspect that that's as valued in this century as it was in the first century regarding how God looks at His church. Isn't it so? Well, let's try to apply it and live it. Father, thank You for what we learned this evening. I ask that You'd help us not only to believe it, but in a practical way, Lord, to live it. We ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank You for your attention. You're dismissed.